And then we got our good old teenagers, our, our adolescents. Let's see what we got with them. Earlier, I mentioned to you that teenagers typically come to us when they're in a crisis. Can I paint the picture of a patient that I had? Um, and the only reason I, I think that, because I'll never forget this kid. When I worked in Atlanta with Dr. Ed Gottlieb, when I was teaching, I always had an opportunity to have a practice day. And that was great because I could bring students with me that wanted to spend some time, you know, we could work together. So what happened was this kid came in, and no joke, you have to visualize, he had a purple mohawk. Now, y'all get ready. Now, here in California, you probably see stuff like this all the time. Where I was, we didn't see a lot of this. But he had a purple mohawk. He had 27 earrings in each ear. And he had beautiful body art. He had tattooed saying. I can't even remember what it said. I wrote it down somewhere, and I can't find it. But anyways, he had it, it went up his arm, across his back, and down the other arm. I mean, I could barely take my eyes off of him. He was a piece of work. He had collected nine problems, crisis, and came to the doctor. And he was an emancipated minor, to boot, which meant that he was on his own as a minor. And so he had come up with all these problems. So naturally, you know, I remember Dr. Gottlieb, he looks like a Santa Claus. He goes, nine problems, you know. And so what you do with kids like that is you, you get them all organized and you prioritize. And he did. He kept coming back. The kid came com coming back. Once you get them hooked, you can get them to, to come back. But it's getting them to come see you. Now, teenagers are supposed to come visit every year for a physical. But they don't always do it unless they have a job or a sports physical or something. So we do know it's 12 to 20 years. It's that bridging between school age and adulthood, three transitional periods because it's so huge. We think about that early, mid, late adolescent. And you know what? They're very different. An early adolescent can be quite rebellious and standoffish. And I will tell you, on the exam, Pink Pig, they always ask a question about who is the primary influence on a teenager? Well, a lot of us will pick peers, but the answer is parent, the parent figure. Even though they gravitate towards peers, the parental figure is the most important. Now, let's talk about physical. Rapid changes in reproductive skeletal muscular cardiovascular system, secondary sexual characteristic development, and peak height velocity. This is the time they go through that growth spurt. Logical abstract thinking is where they're moving towards, and psychosocial, the sense of identity, and they're very narcissistic. Because they're what? Focusing on self to figure out who they are, right? And we still use bright futures, and bright futures brings forward all that subjective, objective management plan. Again, here's one little tip. I really like using this GAPS, which is by the American Medical Association. It's really helpful for you to know about preventive services. For example, some of you may work with these old-time pediatricians. You know, a lot of these pediatricians, if you have a sexually active adolescent female and the pediatrician doesn't want to do paps and pelvics and things like that, you are bound to making sure that that gets done because of the fact that, you know, they are needing certain services. So the GAPS provides a little bit more support. And I'll only point that out to you because it's really a great little resource. We also know that the interview is important. The interview is, again, using diagrams. Uh, we think about um, um, oftentimes uh, you're looking for things that they kind of shun away, don't want to talk about, encourage expression, feelings, concerns. Um, oftentimes if they just, and I had one the other day that came in. The kid was, here's another one. The, parent, the mother made him come in. As a matter of fact, he made the appointment. I went in to see him, and then during the the, the uh, appointment, my nurse comes in and hands me a note that the mother wants to talk to me. Well, I'm not going to leave out and go talk to the mother right then and there, but then she wrote another note down. The kid had apparently left home, was a runaway, was in Iowa living in a car, and she didn't know everything else that he was involved in. So I thought, well, let me just see what he has to say. What's his story? And of course, he doesn't know that she's writing all this stuff down, so you know it's back and forth. But what happened was he stood there like this and just stared at me and really like stared me down like he was almost defiant well he's been back a couple times he and I are getting a better relationship going in terms of working together but when you what I asked him was I said tell me what's a typical day for you remember the interview is really key 
what is a typical day for you? Maybe they'll, they, you know, they'll probably think, gosh, is somebody interested in knowing what my typical day is like? You know? Next question, what's the best thing in your life? Then the next question should be, what's the worst thing in your life? So you see, you're asking open-ended questions that are meaningful and relevant to them. So those are going to be important. You want to maximize the interview. Remember, they're identity-seeking, rebellious, and flexible, redefining their sexual role, sexuality, and trying to become independent. We do have all kinds of strategies like the heads format, like who lives at home and do you have a job? How many hours a week do you work? Tell me about school, what's your favorite subject, what's your best, what's your, what grades are you making? You know what I'm saying? You want to ask about activities. You have friends. Do your friends do drugs? Do you have any reason to need STD testing? You have boyfriend, girlfriend. You see what I'm saying? You kind of ask all these questions. There's also the paces and the safe teens, and there's actually several more that you can use. But whatever it is, you've got to gather the information. In your physical exam, this is a time of physical maturing, secondary sexual characteristics, most dramatic is during this time frame. Vision and hearing, I will tell you this. When kids go through their growth spurt, the surge of hormones, it's always very important to reassess their visual acuity because sometimes it goes askew because of the hormonal changes. Vital signs, physical exam proceeds again head to toe. Now, believe it or not, Tanner, on the exam, pink pig, four and five questions on Tanner. Isn't that something? Seems like a lot. So let's take a moment. Tanner, Dr. Tanner, in Oxford, England in 1962, you don't need to know this, but I just, again, I love history. Same year that, what, Ritalin was discovered, um, he came up with a little strategy that aligned physical features with hormonal changes. So we can advise kids. Remember, kids are identity seeking. They want to know, are they normal? Are they like their peers? Are they going to be tall? So we look at sexual maturity rating that looks at both genital breast, pubic hair development. And this one came out of actually um, uh, contemporary pediatrics. For example, they always want to know that you know when the penis elongates, stage three. And you can see here, look at this. Testy scrotum penis, pre-adolescent, then it enlarges, scrotum roughens, reddens, it elongates, enlarges in breath, rugae appear in, in shape and appearance. Now let's think about this. We're focusing on the scrotal sac, right? The rugae, roughening and reddening, one and two, one and two. Then the penis elongates. And then it, what, enlarges in breath, and then we focus back up on the scrotal sac. Now somebody came up with that creative thing. Isn't that something? So see, see what you too can come up with in publishing, in your publishing career. Um, girls, breast development, we really don't have anything much for this, but we do know that breast, they like to know when breast buds appear, stage two. You guys know, this is pretty much knowledge based. Breast enlargement without separate nipple contour, areola develops, and then the breast red recedes and nipple retracts. So it just becomes more um, adult-like. And then you've got your um, pubic hair development from sparse, pale, fine, dark, increased, curlier, more adult-like, voluminous, and adult pattern being said it's on the thighs. So what does this all mean to us? Why is this important, okay? Well, the reason before I go into development monitoring is to think about what does this mean to us? Well, when you look at developmental monitoring, we think about that peak height velocity is reached. It's associated with tanner staging. We know that teenagers are becoming long gangly, musculoskeletal development. Actually, it's the skeleton that kicks in first, right? It's the height. Then the muscles catch up. Let's talk about that. Where does CDC say the most motor vehicle accidents occur? What age? And when they first start driving. That young, mid-adolescent who is just going what? Going through their growth spurt because their muscular system hasn't caught up so they're less coordinated and less control. We also know that for females, female menses, menarche between breast development stages three and four, predominantly at four, it has been shown through data. If you ask a young lady who comes into your practice and says, am I going to be taller? Am I going to be like my peers? I'm kind of short. And you ask her, has you, have you started your periods? Has menarche occurred? You could tell her that the science tells us 
that you're at stage four. And stage four means that you have gone through your growth spurt, but you might pick up another inch or two throughout adolescence. So you could tell her. And so a lot of it is reflective of where she is with her family patterns. Males begin nocturnal emissions, which they're not going to probably tell you about, but usually at stage three. And five, onset of puberty before eight in girls and nine in boys is considered um, to be precocious. And remember earlier when we did school age, we talked about looking at breast development. That's because of some of this. Now, Erickson says this is a time of identity versus role confusion, Piaget, abstract thinking, cognitive abilities, younger adolescent daydreams, try, uh, trouble staying focused. As an adolescent progresses, they try to be creative. They like a little humor, a little intellectual challenge. And when we think about how young adolescents, they usually conform to peer groups. But again, as I mentioned, parents are still the main influence. Uh, there may be some parent-child conflict, express anger. And then our older adolescents usually start to become a little bit less emotionally labile, reestablish rapport with their parents. They have a better sense of self-esteem and confidence. That's where you want them to be, is to figure out who they are. So in Tistory Guidance, when we think about this, as parents remain the primary influence, as I mentioned, discipline is more of negotiation, being flexible, using your adults that are in their lives as role models, reinforce honesty, um, respect. Um, ex I love this. Expect histrionics from adolescents. Isn't that the truth? You all know what I mean, but drama, right? And um, nutrition is very important. You know, you got vegan, vegetarian diets, dieting. How many kilocalories per kilogram per day did they need? 45. Remember that? We talked about We went from the six-month-old that needed 120 down to adolescents, 45 down to us at 30 to 32. And um, so what we want to think about is, um, you know, continue all their dental health, the sexuality. Well, you know what? By the time you get to teenagers and sexuality, you're mainly reinforcing questions, answering questions that they have. This is also a time that you may see questions about gender identity, right? Gay and lesbian questions and so forth. I have a young lady who is in my practice. I'm her primary care provider, but she is becoming a male not through me as a specialist, but I'm her primary care. She's doing this through a clinic in Atlanta. I'm learning a lot from her because that's, you know, that's something that I'm not prepared for in terms of, so I learn a lot. They're, they're working a lot with hormones and things like that. Um, mental health uh, is very important, gang activity. You need to know about any teenager that shows any change in their behavior, performance in school, personality changes. Usually this is the time you want them to learn how to accept failure you know, and, and kind of garner up some skills and so forth. Certainly talk of suicide, withdrawing from family and friends. Um, and the one issue that we want to talk about is an eating disorder. And I already told you earlier, you don't want to use the word diet. You want them to really have good nutrition, being active. But when you have an eating disorder, which is the main term is what? Anorexia nervosa, for which one of the subtypes is bulimia, which is the binge and purge, binge and purge. And you know when you have binge and purging, what are you doing? You're looking for the erosion of the teeth from the acid. Um, but you want to think about it's got a pretty good mortality rate to it. And the things that you're going to be concerned about, certainly weight loss, but anemia, amenorrhea, dry skin, constipation, low vital signs, lanugo, um, and there's your vomiting, self-induced vomiting, evidence of it. But amenorrhea is important. Amenorrhea is important because once you stop having menses, the young lady messes up her estrogen progestin balance, okay? And therefore, usually women who have had a history of having an uh, eating disorder often need to be watched more closely and earlier for bone density because the estrogen progesterone imbalances and so forth. So those of you who are FNPs, when you have an older, you know, a middle-aged young woman that's had that, that would be something you'd consider. We also think about differentially, you got your pregnancy, depression, substance abuse, organic disease. Your labs, really, um, in terms of diagnostics, is you're really tracking their, uh, their ideal body weight for level of malnutrition. So is it mild, moderate, or severe as to 20, 20 to 30% or 30% less than their ideal body weight. You know, working with someone that has an eating disorder is hugely challenging. 
uh, takes an interdisciplinary management team, uh, lots of behavior modification, psychotherapy. They may need to be hospitalized. So it's not something, and it recurs. There's a lot of recurrence. And one of the things they have found that works with kids with this is hypnosis, self-hypnosis, where they, when they get anxious, think about a lot of times eating disorders are associated with people who are very type A, have high expectations of self, and they're very anxious. So therefore, teaching them how to do some calming effect would be helpful. So that was our, our um, adolescence.